when they called us. John, the 12th chapter. I thought it's, I kept thinking 22nd, but it's the 12th chapter. Okay. Oh. I'm not thinking very clearly right now. We're getting now. We'll start about the 28th verse. It says, Now is my soul trouble. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered, and others said, An angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the day. And thank you as we come together again, Lord, as a church. May you be with our service tonight. Touch those hearts here tonight. Lift us up and give us encouragement and strength. Be with us as we go into our business meeting. May it be done properly and with the, uh, the proper decorum. Forgive us of our sins and failures. In Christ's name we ask it all. Amen. I listened, uh, I, look, I copied some of these down, but these were actual answers that children gave in Sunday school. Yeah. Okay. Ask about Adam and Eve, and they said uh, Adam and Eve were created from an apple. Noah's wife was called Joan of the Ark. King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. <laughs> Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. Moses led the Hebrews to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread without anything in it. The seventh commandment is, Thou shall not admit adultery. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the standard of today, isn't it? We don't admit it. No. You know, when you think about kids, you kind of expect kids to get things wrong, right? The problem is, is when the adults get things wrong. They think they, they take God's Word and they start twisting it around and turning it around. When adults distort the Scripture or change the Scripture, it's because they don't agree with what it says. And we have so many that don't agree with it. Someone once said, people don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. They reject the Bible because it contradicts them and the way they live their lives. Folks like, like that know the Bible, but they don't agree with it. And so what do they do? They end up not believing theologically what the Bible is telling us. We have... We have so many people that instead of, they try to tell you what it says instead of reading what it says. They try to tell you. It's like the news service now. They try to tell you what the news is, what it means. Why They give you their opinion. Same thing with the Bible. People give their opinion. A thought that comes in mind as we... Go into this week. This Sunday will be the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And I've been researching the landmark case that allowed abortion in a country. And one thing that I realized was that though this is the one that made it legal for the whole country, abortion was legal in a lot of states already before this happened. They were already saying it started in one and then it would go to another. And even some of the states that uh, 
had a, it was illegal on the books, they just turned turned their head and they allowed it to happen without saying anything. So it's Satan. That's the way he works. He starts out with just a little, and then it gets a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And what you think about it right now in America, when we're talking about the drug culture, what do we do? Who? What was the first state? To Legalized marijuana. Hmm? Oregon. Oregon, I think. Yes. They legalized it for recreational use, not medicinal, okay? All of them, most of them, started out medicinal use, okay? Then it went for recreational. Now, then, most every state now is allowing marijuana for recreational use. But I notice also that some of the states now are allowing you to use what they call recreational drugs. Cocaine. Uh, it's the pills that the people take. So it, say, you can see how Satan works. He, he starts out just a little, and then a little more, and then a little more, and a little more. And it's destroying all the morals of America. And it's the same way with everything. It's the same thing with uh, uh, homosexuality. It's a little... Uh, it was, they started tolerating it here and they started tolerating it there. And next thing you know, it's the law of the land. What we find and what... To, after I've said all of that, is to point to the fact that you're reading here in John that people do not want what God's Word says. They do not want that. The Jesus that they want is this all-loving God that would never do anything no matter what you do. He would never punish you. But the Bible never says that. He is a just God also. In fact, I titled this, This is not what I wanted. <laughs> Amen? This is not what I wanted. When people, uh, a lot of people now, when they see Christianity, they hear they want to become a Christian. But it is not, a Christian life is not what they want. They want their life and call it Christian. Part of the reason is that, as, as we read in that 32nd verse, and I, if I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men unto me. People, and it's down through history, they, they do not like the idea that a true Savior would die. They just don't believe that that's possible. The Messiah was what? The Bible promised what? The Messiah would live forever. And He is. But they do not want that. They do not, want, they do not see power in a person dying. In the 35th verse, it talks about, yet a little while is the light with you. A lot of people, the scholars down through the time in the Old Testament Bible, uh, the Jews of the day, when Jesus was here, they could not see a Savior that would die. They could not see a Messiah that would die. The people, in 34th verse, the people answered them, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? <laughs> You see, a lot of people doubt this concept of a person who died that took away the sins of the world. If you read over in, in the Old Testament in Psalm 89, 35, it says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. 
Isaiah 9, 7 says, Of the increase of the government of peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth forever. This lasts forever. It is not a temporary thing. A lot of people will look at Jesus Christ. Well, He lived for a while. Lived 33 years and then He died. The Bible says that Jesus lives forever and ever. And when it says forever, the Messiah would what? He'd endure forever. He'd be the prince forever. His kingdom's going to last forever. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ came to earth to do. A lot of people do not believe that. A lot of people reject the whole Word of God because of that. Now, I'll get to what I'm talking about here in just a minute. When the Jews were looking for a Messiah, what were they looking for? A king, right? They wanted a royalty king what, that would rid them of Rome. <laughs> They thought that they would, would rid them and not have Rome bothering them anymore. They wanted it to be a powerful nation like it was during Solomon's time. But the Messiah that God sent didn't fit their image, didn't fit what they wanted. You see, that's what's wrong with Christianity today. It doesn't fit what the people want it to be. They're trying to make Christianity what they want it to be. It's scary. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He said to show by what kind of death he must die. The crucifixion and the resurrection upsets people. For the Jews, for example, the idea of the Messiah would what? that he would die, that was unthinkable. Even though they had Isaiah's prophecy, they would not believe that he should die. One of the greatest prophecies, in fact, in the Old Testament, you find in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of the peace was upon Him. With His stripes were we healed. Jews, uh, Dor and I had a, we had a great pastor when we was down at, for a while down at Union Fort. Dr. Dan Mal. He was a doctor of theology. And very, very learned man. But he was... It worked with a group that they, uh, I forgot what they call the group that he's with. But anyway, it's about the, the is nation of Israel. He is really uh, uh, pushes uh, that our, our relationship with the nation of Israel. And in fact, the, he's a writer. He writes in a book that he has in a magazine that uh, carries his articles. And he talks about our relationship with the Jewish people. And studied, I mean, he knows all the way back. He knows the Bible from front to back and all the words and the Hebrews and the, the Greek and the Latin and whatever, whatever. He knows it all, okay? And he tried to explain to us that the Jewish people today, when they get to chapter 53 in Isaiah... They ignore it. They will not accept it. They won't even, they won't even read it. They, they, and he said you can ask them about it. And they will give you some tale about what that is. But it is, they say the, it was not the Messiah. It was not, the, it was not Jesus Christ is what they're going to tell you. Okay? For the biggest part, they just ignore it. A man by the name of Max Axelrod, he picked up a Jewish study Bible. And, and anyway, he was thought, well, I, I'll, I'll read some in this Jewish study Bible. And when he did, when he was reading through it, 
He said, well, I'll turn to chapter 53 in Isaiah and see what they said. And in, the, in great big letters, it says, this is a very difficult passage. Okay? In other words, we don't want this. It's in there, but we don't want that. Some of our modern, modern religious groups also have called God a cosmic abuser. Think about that. This is the, the new progressive Christian uh, attitude. Um, here's a guy in this message, uh, the lost message of Jesus. And he says that we should be appalled at the fact that God put Jesus on the cross to die. In other words, He abused His Son. He abused His children. He's saying He's promoting child abuse. It says, A vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he has not even committed. This is what this is modern this is modern uh, Christianity beliefs today, okay? These come from whatever Christians. Has anybody read The Shack? Yeah, Dora did. I thought she did. I refused. Huh? I refused that. <laughs> well, <laughs> when he wrote this, you know, he, he and himself uh, talked about being, uh, you're worshiping a, a child abuser, is what you're doing. And, uh, <laughs> that Christian people should never accept the fact that God would punish His Son. Now in this book, I, did read, I didn't read it, Dor did. But it talked, or I don't know, did you read the book or saw me? I read the book. Okay. Talks about God in this is a big black woman, okay? <laughs> so, and uh, so, we can see right off the bat that there's something wrong here, okay, to begin with. Yes, it is. Well, what says God can be anything you want Right. Like I said, it's Well, there is a book, by the way, there is a book dismantling the shack that tears apart all his theology in that book. Really? Yeah. You already did but in this book, he, he goes on to say, well, first of all, he, he agrees that he can't leave out the fact there was a crucifixion, okay? He, he, he puts that in. But he tries in all of it to keep the God that we worship to try to keep that out of it. He doesn't want that in there, okay? As you said, he makes his own God, okay? So how dare we believe that God had somehow planned all of this? had planned for His Son to die on a cross. In other words, He's denying Acts 2.23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew that it was going to happen. In Galatians 3.13, Christ had redeemed us for the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. God had planned this for a long time. Now granted, the cross, I will admit, is a cruel way to die. I think they only said there was only one more cruel that you could think of, and that would be drawn and quartered. And uh, I don't want to describe that. It is very gruesome, okay? But uh, this is what, what I'm trying to get at is, is people are trying to come up with their own view of the Bible. And they're trying to tell us that this is what it is. But it's not. They need to pick up God's Word and read it is what they need to do. What thus saith the Word. I run across this about Billy Joel. Anybody know who Billy Joel is? American musician, songwriter, singer. 
He goes on to say, now, we talk about uh, Christian people, you know, and their attitude. Now, some atheists too have their own ideas about what God's done. But he said, I wasn't raised Catholic, but I used to go to Mass with my friends. And I viewed this whole business as a lot of very enthralling hocus pocus. says, there's a guy nailed to a cross, dripping with blood, and everyone's blaming themselves for it. He said, I can tell you this. I myself will say, forget it. I had no hand in that evil. I had no original sin. There's no blood of any sacred martyr on my hands. I said, I'll just pass on all of this. So many people in America today, even Christians, are saying the same thing. Let's, let's put it this way. So-called Christians. And that's the way I always do. So-called Christians. They call themselves Christians. But it is not the Christian of the Bible. It is not the ones who they said were first called Christians. This is not the same thing. Joel goes on to comment. I don't need God's help to pay for my sins. I'm not a bad person. I've done bad stuff in my life, but I've done a lot of good things too. His problem is what? He's looking at Christ's sacrifice backwards. He's blaming what? Everyone's blaming themselves for that man's torment. So the first misunderstanding that he has, first one that he really has, is that he thinks that Jesus is just a man. Jesus was not a man. Jesus was God incarnate. He was fully God. In fact, John, who wrote this gospel we've got, makes a reference to Jesus and the Godhead. John said, These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. Isaiah 6 1, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You're going down to the fifth verse. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. When he talks about Lord here, it's all caps. He is talking about God, Jehovah, Yahweh. Who's he said? I saw God. I saw God. When Isaiah saw God high and lifted up, that was Jesus Christ that he's talking about. Jesus was God. On the cross, Jesus was not a mere man. He was God. And He was not a helpless victim. You've got to remember this. He didn't have to go to the cross. He went because He loved us so much. It was all voluntary. And the second misunderstanding that Billy Joel has, He looks at it as like Jesus got up here as a guilt trip for you and I. You know, that was not what it was. Everyone is blaming themselves for what? For man's torment? No. Jesus was tormented on the the cross because He chose to. Never because I sent Him there. Not personally. I didn't send Him there. Only in a way in that He died for my sins. The guilt was already there. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 3, Among whom also we had had our conversation time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, were by nature of children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, Wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. A lot of people look at this passage and they say, well, that means that we're worthless. Christians are worthless. Must be. 
Because He had to die for us, we must be worthless. No, we are priceless. We are so priceless that He would sacrifice His life. So we are good. In Romans 5, 8, But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that a wonderful verse? I mean, that is so wonderful. That no matter Him knowing what I'd done, He died on the cross. Do you feel free from your sin? Only through the blood of Christ, right? I used this illustration once. I'm a, I think it's kind of cute, so I'm going to do it again. It talks about a young boy, and he, for Christmas, he got him a new slingshot. And uh, he's proud of it. Boy, he, he got out and he was, he was taking this thing and he was shooting everything. He tried to shoot. He put up targets and all this stuff. And man, he wasn't very good at it. He, he missed everything he was shooting at. But he sure did like it. So he, anyway, he was out in the backyard and all of a sudden, Grandma's pet duck come running by. Man, he pulled out his slingshot. <laughs> Uh-oh, hit it right in the head. Dover it went, died right there, just right on the spot. Man, he didn't know what to do. He grabbed it up and he took it and hid it. And he thought, well, I've got to buy with it. Until he found out his sister had seen him do it. So after lunch that day, Grandma said, now, Sally, you need to help with the dishes. Sally looked up and said, no, I think Johnny wants to help with the dishes. Isn't that right, Johnny? Didn't you, Johnny? Didn't you want to do that? And then kind of whispered, you remember the duck. So anyway, so Johnny goes on and he did the dishes and whatever. You know, that went on for a week or two. And then finally, every time something had come up, she'd say, remember the duck. Finally, he just couldn't stand it any longer. So he went and told his grandma, told her what happened, that he'd accidentally killed her duck. And she said, you know, son, I saw what happened. I was looking out the window when it happened. She said, I love you. I forgave you immediately. But I wondered how long you was going to let Sally make a slave out of you. So how long are we going to let the devil make a slave out of us? You know, we, we do. He whispers in your ear, remember the duck. Remember the duck. Jesus did what? He died free us from that slavery of sin, didn't He? And actually, it's not just the slavery of sin, it's the slavery of guilt. You know? I, 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 I've lived a sinful life. I know I have. I remember the things. And, and, and I, used to say, I used to pray, God, just not let me remember those things. You know something? The harder I try to forget, the more He brings them up. And I realized one day, He's trying to tell you, don't do that again. You know what? You, now you know not what to do anymore. He died because He loved you. So we don't... This modernized Christianity that we have today, we need to stick to God's Word, what it says. There's parts in this Word, I'm going to tell you, I don't like. Okay? I'll be quick and honest. There's parts I don't like. And particularly the parts where it gets on my toes. Amen. And it's